Welcome to Worlds Apart. The Trump victory has appended many political and sociological wisdoms that few until recently dared to question, let alone challenge. And while America is still overcome by an emotional response, many around the world are taking a critical look at the latest US election to see if their own approach to electoral politics needs to be revisited. Well, to discuss some of that, I'm now joined by Shashi Tharoor, an Indian politician and former UN Under Secretary General. Mr. Tharoor, it's so good to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Great to be with you, Oksana. Thank you. Now, there are so many things that you can draw from uh, Trump's victory, which I know came as a big surprise to you. Uh, you are on record predicting that Ms. Clinton uh, would win, just as uh, I guess the majority of people I interview on this show. I wonder if that stunning victory produced any bit of um, self-doubt on your part and how well you understand the world and the United States for that matter. Well, you know, I was also in London the day of the Brexit vote, and I didn't anticipate that either. So I'm beginning to realize that a lot of experience in world affairs does not necessarily amount to a great capacity for prediction in today's climate. Uh, having seen the, um, the result uh, that Mr. Trump was able to pull off, as you know, there is one element that all of us can shield ourselves behind, which is that Mrs. Clinton still got about two million votes more than he did. The Electoral College worked its magic to help him. But having said that, that's not an excuse. We're supposed to be aware of that as we predict the outcome. And I would say that what is striking is how widespread Mr. Trump's support was and how many states he was able to carry that Mr. Obama had carried in the last couple of um, elections. And it would seem, if you take Trump, if you take Brexit, it does seem there is a trend here that Mr. Trump is merely the latest epitome of and not so much of an outlier after all. Dr. Theodore, uh, you wrote a few days ago that one major casualty of Donald Trump's victory is America's soft power around the world, that instead of coming across as this land of uh, inspiration and possibilities, it now presents itself to the world as a land of misogyny and discrimination. And I think that is a, very much in line with this um, righteous liberal narrative which uh, Ms. Clinton represented that sees everything in stark terms of good versus evil. Wasn't it actually that narrative that indeed relies heavily on the tools of soft power that was defeated in this election? Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely right. In fact, if you look at the um, aftermath of the election, it's been less than a week now since they counted the votes. Uh, you're looking at a country where a number of American citizens who are not white are being told in public places, time to go home now, uh, and other such comments where many black Americans and brown Americans have felt the disquiet that have been unleashed because uh, of the Trump victory. It's not necessarily that the people at the top wish to see a divided nation. I'm sure they don't. It is much more that a lot of undercurrents bubbling below the surface of an ostensibly tolerant, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and pluralistic country have suddenly emerged and they're much more xenophobic. Well, uh, Dr. Theodore, let's be balanced here because some Clinton supporters are now acting in the way they predicted the Trump electorate would react to his laws by burning American flags, vandalizing cars, looting stores. Is that really about Trump or Clinton as much as the sort of this general political culture which happens to be highly polarized at the moment? Well, look, I think this election was already so polarizing in American society that whoever had won, there would have been an initial period of outright rejection of the results by the other side. What you're seeing now with the protests that you describe would certainly have been mirrored by the other side if Mrs. Clinton had won. So I don't really think that this in itself is a surprise. But what is more worrying, of course, is the perception on the part of the, if you like, the Clinton supporters, the Democrats and others, particularly people from uh, the non-white male background that seems predominantly in Mr. Trump's corner, 
Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, 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 the white male background is in Mr. Trump's corner, so the non-whites feel a vulnerability and an insecurity and a sense of being unwelcome that they had not felt before. In fact, the victory of Obama had made them feel particularly secure and accepted. But, uh, Dr. Theroux, what you're talking about here are perceptions and fears, and there have already been some indications that some of those fears may be intentionally whipped up as a reaction to Trump's election. For example, some of the accounts of uh, Muslim women being abused uh, have been proven fake already. So uh, I'm not saying this is not a real problem. Uh, in fact, uh, racism and xenophobia do exist in the United States, and uh, many believe that they do need to be addressed in a straightforward way rather than being, you know, hidden behind the, you know, the slogans of political uh, correctness. Wouldn't the United States actually benefit from addressing this problem head on? If there is some, some of such incidents, there is also a counter reaction from the society, a society developing antibodies against it. Isn't that actually a good thing? Well, um, yes, to some perhaps, but certainly not to the world majority. Because, you know, um, if you look at the classic roots of American soft power, there were these things, these, um, if you like, liberal, multi-ethnic, tolerant values, the sense of America as a land of, uh, of uh, infinite possibilities that made it America so attractive. You know, the joke was that even those protesting American foreign policies outside American embassies in the world were also shouting, Yankee, go home, but take me with you. There was so much of a sense of attractiveness of the American lifestyle. Now suddenly, after this, and after the stories that are coming out, even if one or two of those stories are not true, many of the stories coming out are worryingly real and alarming. I don't think the same sense of um, America being this luminous, shining magnet that everyone is attracted to uh, can still be said to hold true. Now one thing that struck me in particular about this whole campaign uh, was the use of shaming and vilification as a political tool, uh, particularly, I would argue, by the Clinton camp and describing Trump supporters as deplorables. And uh, a number of experts are now suggesting that this may have played a role in skewing the polls in both the U.S. election and previously in the, in the Brexit vote. People making up their mind, but because their political choice uh, as, is presented as unacceptable, they wouldn't tell that choice to the pollsters. If that's the case, wouldn't that be a worrying signal, especially for democracy? Yes, it is. But, I mean, don't forget, first of all, that there were definitely mistakes made on both sides. I think if we start cal cataloging Mr. Trump's mistakes, that's not a very pretty picture either. Uh, and certainly Mrs. Clinton may have said things or done things that, uh, that we can find fault with. But one key point remains that at the end of the day, more Americans voted for Hillary Clinton than voted for Donald Trump. And therefore, it seems to me that it would be unwise of Mr. Trump and his supporters to see this as an overwhelming mandate for their way or the highway, the usual American um, attitude that Victor takes all. I honestly think this election has revealed <coughs> such a fundamental 50-50 split in the society that it would actually be in the interests of the winners to try and take some of the losers along with them now, media, of course, played a huge role in both the British and the American votes. And uh, it just happened so that uh, I spent the last week before the US election in, in Europe. And I was stuck with CNN, which was so unabashedly pro-Clinton that even uh, for a Russian, and you know, let's admit, in this country, we have a lot of authority-friendly media. But even for me, that was way too much. I wonder if the liberal media, paradoxically uh, as it is, helped Miss Clinton lose by essentially force-fitting her to the voters. Yeah, this is a very interesting point, Oksana, because there is no question that the media was overwhelmingly pro-Hillary and anti-Trump. In fact, uh, I think somebody saw the list of the top 51 newspapers in the United States, and 50 of them endorsed Hillary. I'm not even sure which one was the one that was uh, brave enough to stand for itself uh, on this matter. So there is no question that the liberal elite, the liberal media consensus 
entirely favored one side in this debate. And as you know, around the world, there has been a certain suspicion of the media amongst these more right-wing populist movements. Um, they have all tended to say the media reflects a sort of preferred conventional wisdom of the establishment and the establishment elites, which uh, these insurgents are campaigning against. And it certainly has been a body blow, I think, to those in the media who fancied that not only do they set the agenda for a country's politics, but they also help influence and determine the outcome. Very clearly, the media did not succeed in influencing or determining the outcome. And, and Mr. Trump can now take pot shots of the media knowing full well that he owes them nothing. So it really is quite striking. And there are some issues in which, in all fairness, Mr. Trump had the courage to challenge the media's conventional wisdom. One very good example is with regard to your own country. But in some ways, it does seem that the American public may watch the media, read the media, but in the end, will vote for how they feel. I'm sure the role of the media in this election will be started for, for years to come, not only because of them closing their ranks behind Hillary Clinton, but also because of the amount of free coverage Donald Trump uh, got throughout this campaign. But I wonder if we put the media aside, how much of this election outcome was due to this particular set of competitors? Didn't they provide a unique foil for one another? If it was any other configuration, configuration don't you think that perhaps the, the, uh, the outcome wouldn't have been so controversial and the campaign wouldn't have been so unconventional as it has been? Well, the American system, as you know, always reduces a presidential election to an either or binary choice between two specific candidates. And each candidate is arrived at through a primary process in which various factors come into play, but most of all, their ability to appeal to their own voter base. In the case of Trump, the first belief was that he couldn't possibly win a primary against far more experienced politicians, but that he could make some waves and get some attention, but no more than that. Well, he proved them wrong. He led from the start, and in fact, from the time when there were 19 or 20 candidates in the primaries, he was number one throughout, and that's something people tend to forget. Then when he won the nomination, people said, there's no way he can win the election. The American public won't vote for a maverick like this. Once again, they were proven wrong. In fact, on the Democratic side, the election of Hillary was in the face of, if you like, a left-wing mirror version of Trump, somebody who also inflamed passions with a lot of lively and sometimes angry rhetoric in his campaigning, Bernie Sanders. Uh, but she actually represented the triumph of the mainstream consensus that a candidate who represents the middle of the road always has a better chance of prevailing at the end of the day, which is why I think from the moment she won the nomination and Trump won the nomination, many of us assumed the election was as good as over, that it was an election that she could not possibly lose. Well, we were proven wrong. So this is very striking. I think you're right that these two particular candidates gave us this very memorable uh, election result. Well, uh, Dr. Tharoor, we have to take a short break now, but when we come back, Modi, Putin, Erdogan, and now Trump, there's a tendency to throw all these leaders into one basket of a liberal nationalist. Do they really have that much in common beyond simply being males? That's coming up in a moment on Worlds Apart. Stay tuned. Worlds Apart, we are discussing the emergence of nationalism around the world with Shashi Tharoor, an Indian politician and former UN Undersecretary General. Dr. Tharoor, uh, I heard you say that Trump may be part of this global wave of predominantly male populist leaders who appeal to the cultural nativism of their, uh, of their people and who may be brought about by this sense of insecurity engendered by globalization. I wonder if you see that as a um, deviation from the norm or as perhaps a, a new norm emerging? Yes, I think that, you know, I used to speak around the world for the last 15 years about globalization. And now I think I'm going to have to start speaking about the anti-globalization trends. Uh, because one common feature of many of these movements, in fact, there was more than one common feature. One is certainly a suspicion of globalization 
and of the erasing of national boundaries. All these leaders have in common a desire to assert their national boundaries and national identities. Second, they are all against the free movement of people, immigration, people of different colors, ethnicities, and religions coming to their countries, living there. They don't like that. Third, they are very suspicious of free trade, and they are not at all enthusiastic about foreign investment. If American companies go and invest in China, the perception now is not that it will mean cheaper Chinese goods for American consumers. The perception is much more that it will mean American workers no longer have jobs because those jobs have gone to China. All of these are common features of all of these groups. Marine Le Pen in France, who is not male after all, Gert Wilders in the Netherlands, the Brexit movement in Britain, Donald Trump in America, uh, Mr. Viktor Orban, and for that matter, the Jobbik movement in Hungary. Example after example, some might even say to some degree Narendra Modi in India, are all typical of these elements, except Mr. Modi on economics is much more open to the rest of the world, perhaps because India needs to be. But in every other case, I would argue these are all common features, which mean that the globalized world that we knew is no longer going to be, I think, something we can take for granted. Uh, well, uh, I hope so, to be honest with you, Dr. Tharoor. You, you frame it as anti-globalization movement, but what is? what if it is just returned to what is uh, well familiar to the people? And by that, I mean nationalism. Nationalism as this idea of na nation states being an organizing principle of development because to many people it is a far more natural and time-tested concept rather than globalism. What is actually more transient here, globalism which is only a couple of decades in the making or nationalism which is you know centuries old? Well look everyone obviously is always proud of their national sovereignty and globalization was a way of saying while you're sovereign you would actually open up much more to other countries in order to leverage your national identity along with others in order for everyone to benefit. So for example, the classic stereotype is that of, a, of, an, of an item, a consumer item that is conceived in one country, made in a, uh, sorry, developed as a concept in a second country, designed in a third country, one part is manufactured in a fourth country, another part is manufactured in a fifth country, the whole thing is put together and assembled in a sixth country, and it's sold again in the first country. I mean, this kind of thing, whether it's the Apple iPhone, whether it's many computers, even automobiles increasingly, this was what was happening around the world. I'm sorry for interrupting you here, but you know what you're describing is an economic aspect of globalization, but globalization may, has many levels to it, and one of, that, one of that is national identity, which is, I think, uh, you know, the, the main thing for many people here, because uh, there is a, the kind of globalization that has been promoted around the world of late comes with a very heavy cultural baggage, with a baggage of new cultural values that many people are resisting to. And I think the Indian example is very interesting here because your current prime minister uh, was branded as Hindu nationalist just a couple of uh, years ago. For a decade, he was banned from traveling to the West because he was considered to be a sort of outcast in the, in the civilized uh, Western community. Now he, he's being praised for revitalizing US uh, Indian ties. So what do you think makes uh, the liberal circles so apprehensive of those national aspirations? I mean, nobody, I think, is uh, objecting to economic version of globalism, but what people, a lot of people are reacting to is the cultural assertions of uh, globalism. I think that both aspects, certainly for Mr. Modi in India, on the economics, he is very open to trade and investment with other countries, but culturally, you're right, he's very strongly nationalist. But some of the Western leaders I mentioned, and I mentioned five or six of them, they would all, I think, clarify, I mean, qualify on both categories, culturally and politically nationalist, somewhat xenophobic in their resistance to foreigners and foreign immigration, and at the same time, deeply suspicious of free trade agreements, of foreign investment, of jobs leaving their own countries, and so on. So for them, the economic aspects are also a factor that I believe will impede uh, the sense of globalization there. But Mr. Modi and Mr. Erdogan in Turkey, not the same thing. They're culturally, politically nationalist, and in fact, they're also nationalist about their borders and their country's sovereignty, but they are not nationalist when it comes 
to economics where they realize their economies need foreign trade and investment. So you've got a definite difference with, with those two, with vis-a-vis -vis the Western leaders. But the Western examples I gave you, I think there are no exceptions. The battle in the West is between people like that, like uh, Madame Le Pen and Mr. Orban and the Brexiteers and Mr. Trump on the one hand, and people who have bought into the globalization narrative, whether it's Mr. Hollande or his conservative opponents in France, Mrs. Merkel in Germany or her social democratic opponents, all of these are on both sides of the political, the old political divide in those countries. They were willing to engage with the world and just fight out their domestic differences. But with these other countries and with many other leaders, the difference is much more than domestic political difference. It is an argument about the very way in which their country has to engage with the rest of the world. Uh, I will come back to you, Mr. Trump, in a second. But before we go there, um, while we are still on the topic of globalism, uh, many people on the other side of the debate would argue that uh, globalism essentially, uh, especially value sort of based globalism, is just another iteration of the white man's burden. This righteous idea that, uh, you know, people in Western capital simply know what's better for people in, you know, those distant uh, lands and what is better for people in distant lands also usually happens to be financially beneficial uh, for, for the West as well. Is it fair to represent uh, cultural globalism as this another form of colonialism? No, I, as far as most of us in the developing countries are concerned, our globalization has benefited us. It may have benefited the white man consumer or the white woman consumer in the West, but it gave jobs to people in China and many other developing countries. It helped pull countries out of poverty. Trade gave us access to more markets and investment. Uh, in the case of India, IT, offshoring of services, all of this would not have been possible without globalization. So it has helped transform our countries and promoted growth in our countries. And we are in favor of globalization. The problem, it seems to me, in these developed countries has been that where they feel they have suffered in terms of lost jobs, uh, a stagnating economy, less employment, less possibility to improve their lifestyles beyond the point of getting cheaper goods from abroad, they have chosen to blame foreigners for their plight. If you look at the election campaigns, including Mr. Trump's election, it's the blaming of others for what is seen as the economic plight of the people who voted for Mr. Trump that troubles us. So I certainly hope that a country like the U.S. will not roll down its shutters. Uh, if, if I understand, and we may interpret Trump's message in a very different ways, but uh, I think the way I took his argument, it was ultimately saying that let's put our own house in order before we spend trillions of dollars teaching other people how to live their lives. Uh, at the end of the day, what we are discussing here and the uh, sort of the... Uh, disintegration of uh, American infrastructure, the loss of jobs, is not only due to the economic forces, it's also due to very wasteful spending on wars and, you know, uh, democratic operations overseas. You may describe that as uh, nativist, but isn't that actually that really makes sense? I mean, he, I I'm sure as a businessman he will keep the <laughs> certain aspects of globalism, but I think the central message and his central argument against Hillary Clinton was stop supporting wars overseas that cost us a fortune and don't bring any good to the people we are trying to benefit. Look, Oksana, I have absolutely uh, no difficulty with the argument that America's interventions abroad or its flexing of its muscles half a world away was already now getting to a point where many Americans were tired of it. They wanted America to disengage from Iraq, from Syria. They wanted America not to go too far with its uh, uh, positions on Ukraine, on the South China Sea and all of that. That is certainly a different issue. It seems to me that that is specifically an American issue. It's not so much an issue with the other European leaders I mentioned as an example. America being for the longest time, for 25 years, the world's only superpower after the end of the Cold War, had, it seems, suffered from what the historians used to call imperial overreach. And inevitably, a certain retraction would have been required. But I could argue to you that someone like Mr. Obama was already in the process of fulfilling this retraction. He had pulled troops out of Afghanistan, out of Iraq. He was also pulling troops out of Afghanistan. He had been careful not to get involved beyond a point in Syria or Ukraine or anywhere else. And therefore, he was doing that while at the same time 
remaining connected economically to globalization. Whereas what Mr. Trump has been arguing is against both economic globalization and the geopolitical overreach. So you've got a difference between the America of Mr. Obama and the America of Mr. Trump. And I think that is going to be a very important and significant shift in world affairs. Well, I... I think we, we are yet to see uh, to see if there is going to be any substantial difference because Mr. Trump has uh, voiced a lot of ideas. He has not yet articulated his vision fully. But on the point of uh, President Obama, you know, using globalization, as far as the Russians are concerned, he was uh, using it as uh, America's own tool. The introduction of sanctions uh, essentially claims that, you know, you can use globalization. Globalization is essentially your mechanism. You can apply it both as a stick and as a carrot. And uh, as far as the Russians are concerned, this is not the most you know, fair way of, uh, of, of running the world. But anyway, we, we have to leave it there. I really, really appreciate your time on the show. And uh, to our viewers, please share your thoughts on our Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook pages. And I hope to see you again. Same place, same time, here on Worlds Apart.